This is the Physical Activity Researcher Podcast, a podcast for researchers of sedentary behavior, physical activity, and sports. Join for a relaxed dialogue about research design, practicalities, and, well, anything related to research. Learn from your fellow researchers useful and relevant information that does not fit into formal content and limited space of scientific publications. And here is your host, researcher and entrepreneur, Ali Tikkanen. Welcome everyone. I'm thrilled about today's guest and our forthcoming discussions about artificial intelligence applications in sport and health fields. Our guest is working in the Faculty of Sport and Health Sciences in University of Uvascula and studying at the same time in IT faculty to learn about using AI tools. He is a biomechanist by trade and moving more to AI. Please welcome Associate Professor Neil Cronin. Hi Neil, how is it going? Good morning, thanks for having me. Yeah, really good, can't complain. Yeah, that's good. So, uh, what kind of things you are working at the moment? Well, you did a, a pretty good job of introducing me there. So, as you said, I'm a, a biomechanist by trade, but more recently I've uh, actually been, well, I'm still involved in a master's program where I'm, I'm basically learning about um, tools built around artificial intelligence, so things like deep learning, and looking at ways that we can apply those in the sport and health field more generally. Mm. Uh, because we are in a position now with biomechanics where we're collecting pretty large volumes of data. So we're getting to the point where we actually need more than just a human who's going to be going manually through data and trying to find patterns. So we need help from computers in this case. So that's what I'm, I'm broadly trying to do at the moment. Mm. And what kind of things you have in mind for AI applications in sport and health field? What's, what's your plan? Yeah, so so far I've been playing around with a few different things. So the first one that we did was looking at basically tracking how people move. So we use something called motion analysis quite a lot, where we look at things like joint angles, and um, we try and look at that in relation to the forces that somebody produces. So it gives us a good window into how the, the brain is telling the muscles what to do. And uh, we've looked at, for example, markerless ways of doing that. So basically what that means is instead of having to have really expensive setups and being confined to the lab, you can actually go out into the field and mm. uh, avoid the need for any really expensive hardware. You can just take a few low cost cameras uh, and then you, you train a neural network to do the actual identification of the body parts for you. So you can sort of build a model of a moving human and um, you can do it in new environments where previously we weren't really able to collect data so for example we've done this in the swimming pool people have run um or underwater running it's called mm. uh, but but really there's no limit to where you could apply something like that because uh, in the sport field we might want to look at how athletes move of course but also in in more health clinical applications we might want to look at uh, how a patient moves around their home environment for example and and, and be able to follow them through a rehab protocol so that's one example i've played with uh, another thing that i've worked on a lot is image processing so looking at medical images this is obviously a very common task we have uh, millions of scans that are taken each year and a doctor has to look at those and uh, try and maybe diagnose is there a, a medical condition mm. here or not and um we're now looking at ways to use artificial intelligence to sort of do that for us so that we can cut down on the need for doctors to do these kind of jobs and, and hopefully free up more of their time to actually work with patients instead of uh, working on the on the data processing side. Mm. So with the Im image processing, what kind of uh, images you are using? Like you said, there's many, many people doing it. What's your, what's your specialty yeah, in this so one? Yeah, so if you if you look at the uh, the methods that are out there already, basically every kind of medical image imaginable has already been sort of touched upon. Personally, I'm working with uh, mostly CT scans and ultrasound images. Uh, ultrasound's an interesting one because actually the image quality usually is not very good. So this makes it actually difficult even for humans to do the analysis. Mm. But what we're playing with at the moment is 
training deep neural networks to actually identify features. So that could be the borders of a muscle, for example, it could be muscle fibers. And we train neural networks to identify those things so that potentially somebody like me, the researcher, doesn't have to spend weeks or even months manually placing points in images uh, mm. because I can get the computer to do it for me. Yeah, so it's the motivation for this from your PhD studies, but <laughs> you were actually years putting points Partly, on, yes. on the screen. Partly it's completely selfish uh, because, as you said, I spent probably the best part of two, two and a half years literally just opening individual ultrasound images and placing points on the muscle borders, on the muscle fibers. And it, it's a painfully slow process, yeah. but also it's really subjective. So the way I interpret that image might be different to the way that you interpret it. Mm. And then we get this situation where loads of groups are publishing their results, but because everyone's doing the manual analysis and it's a different mm. person doing it, we get different results and maybe they're partly different just because different people see it from a different perspective. Mm. So that's one side of it is trying to make it more objective, the analysis process. But of course, the, the, the sort of side bonus of that is it does tend to speed things up once you have an algorithm that works well. Yeah, yeah. And so quite often you look the ultrasound images and the muscle muscle fibers or or other things in research. What kind of practical applications you see if this this works well? Well, we're already in a situation at least in America where some of these algorithms have already been approved for use in in the medical care process. So um, for example, retinal scans, mm. um, diabetic neuropathy, um, or retinopathy rather, can be diagnosed from retinal images. And we now have algorithms that can diagnose the condition as well or even better than a group of leading doctors. Mm. And so in America, there's a list of FDA approved algorithms already, which I think is it's got something like 15, 20 algorithms that are already being used in this pipeline. So we're already at this point, uh, or we're at the starting end of this curve, let's say, of um, using AI to actually speed up the process of, of diagnosis. Mm. Uh, and also hopefully, as I said earlier, to, to try and free up some time for the doctors. So this is the biggest complaint that medical doctors make is they want more time to actually work with the patient and less time doing all of the other stuff um, in the back mm. room. So. Yeah. Yeah, and and I I know some of your studies that you have been looking at the muscle fibers for the biomechanics research. Uh, do you see practical applications for detecting the muscle fiber orientation or the aponeurosis or something like this? Yeah, I mean, there's plenty of cases where it's already being used. So my particular interest is human locomotion, usually. So when you look at somebody walking or running, you need to use quite high sampling rates mm. um, because the movement happens quite quickly. So what that means is if you have a high sampling rate, you get more ultrasound images, which means that's more manual clicking of, of uh, these locations in the images. So that's one area where there's already a lot of interest in, in automating the process because, like I said, that was my PhD and it's, uh, it's a painful thing. Mm. And then there are other applications, of course, training studies, for example, look at, they want to look at the effect of a training intervention on muscle architecture. Mm. So we can take images before and even during and after. And in theory, we can actually fully automate that analysis process so that mm. we can even give pretty much real time feedback to these people. Uh, and that's something that potentially you could then take into a clinical setting as well. If you're looking, for example, at, at older people, if you're looking at aging, Mm. Um, maybe sarcopenia type research, you might you might need that information um, really quickly as well. And so we can actually give fast feedback to people um, and get our results mm. immediately. Yeah. And this is what you were doing with ultrasound. What, what kind of things you're doing with the <coughs> CT scans? Yeah, so in a way, similar kind of thing. So usually it's a case of segmenting the image somehow. Um, in this case, we're identifying the borders of the muscles so we can identify what's the um, the overall muscle mass and then we can look at the whole limb of course we've got cross-sectional images from different regions up and down the limb mm. and uh, then we can we can try and look at things like the density of the muscle muscle mm. tissue 
and so we can um, try and get an idea of uh, in this case we're looking at the aging process um, and seeing over the course of a, of a follow-up period do they lose muscle mass um, do the you know do the change of any of these these structures do they change size and this is something again that in theory we can fully automate mm. the pipeline so that we don't need somebody looking at, at let's say 30 scans from the same thigh and trying mm. to manually segment things yeah so how much do you think this will speed up the research when the the most laborious part of the study can be done automatically yeah of course in theory we can i think your typical analysis process if you're talking about maybe tens or even hundreds of subject of subjects you're going to save months in processing time hmm. um you know in my phd studies we only had small sample sizes we only had about 10 or 15 subjects but it soon adds up once you have let's say you want to analyze three strides even hmm. if you're looking at something like 150 images in total per person and then you multiply that by 10 or 15 people and then in each image you've got to click on could be five or six points that all adds up and of course you end up taking weeks or even months to do this so i think the time savings are potentially going to be huge but the the sort of other side of that argument is i think we're unlikely to have algorithms that work perfectly mm -hmm. so in the case of ultrasound it's really really hard sometimes to say where actually are the structures you're looking looking mm. for so if it's hard for a human to do it then it's incredibly hard to train a computer to do it mm. that said if you have an algorithm that works 95 percent of the time and you just have to manually correct the other five percent well then you're still looking at a big time saving compared to doing everything manually yeah yeah how about is there any anything in the pipeline in the future that you could have some kind of markers inside the muscle that would make it make it easier yeah i mean things things like that have been tried so it's been done with tendon a few times mm. where um the copenhagen group for example inserted a needle in the tendon so that when the muscle produced force and the tendon moved yeah. you could from the ultrasound scan you could see the the uh, needle moving um that would simplify things a lot because then training your algorithm would be much easier i mean if mm -hmm. the if the structures that you're looking for are clearly marked yeah. you know it would be a pretty trivial task to to train a network like that um one of the reasons i like working with ultrasound in a way is that it's so difficult to do that yeah. i think that if we can really solve that problem then it will number one it would tell us how powerful these algorithms really can be but number two going to something like a ct scan where the image quality is usually a bit higher mm. should be relatively easy then to, mm. uh, to apply similar kind of methods to different kind of imaging yeah and do you think that the things that you can develop with for ultrasound can be used for other tissues than the muscle tissue afterwards yeah potentially so one of the approaches that i'm using is built on something called unet which was designed broadly for working with medical imaging so uh, it, and it has been applied actually to different kind of different modalities. Hmm. So uh, the general rule that I that I have from from the experience I have with training these models is, if you the human can clearly see the thing that you're trying to identify, hmm. then it should be possible to train, for example, a deep neural network to do that for you. Hmm. But as I said, sometimes you just get you get images that that unfortunately aren't that brilliant. And yeah. they're hard even for us to interpret. So you're always going to get cases like that. Yeah. And how, how do you think the best algorithms for image uh, image processing, can they see things that human eye cannot see? In a way. So the, the analogy that I like to use is that if you think of a medical doctor who mm. looks at, let's say, x-rays, mm. in a day they might look at, I don't know, let's say 10 x-rays. Um, over the course of their life, they're not going to see millions and millions of scans. Mm. And even if they did have time to do that, they're not going to remember all of the subtle little features that mm. they find in different cases. With an AI algorithm, that's the advantage that you have, is that essentially it, it will remember all of the features it's seen. Mm. 
and it can realistically process millions, tens of millions of images. Mm. Um, so it's not all pros. I'm not saying that, that AI is the, the solution to all of our problems, but yeah, realistically, it can look at much bigger volumes of data than a human and it won't forget. And that's very valuable when later on, maybe you have cases where it's not quite so clear cut. It's mm. not so easy for a human to, to say either way, is this a, a diseased scan or not? Mm. Yeah. And, and you said that usually it's not so clear with the muscle, muscle, uh, imaging and ultrasound. Do you, do you still need to check it? by a person or how do you do it at the moment? Yeah, at the moment I do because we're very much at the, the validation stage. So okay. actually the project that will become the master's thesis for my studies is uh, a deep learning based, fully automatic method of analyzing ultrasound scans. So from that we get muscle thickness, um, muscle fascicle length and pination angle. These are the, the main three parameters that we would normally want. Um, and basically, I'm in the process of kind of validating that now and mm. showing that compared to manual analysis, how well does it work? Yeah. And then also comparing to, there are a few open source methods that are semi-automated at least. So I'm comparing basically to everything that's out there and trying to say, where does this fit in on that spectrum? Is it as good? Is it better? Is it worse? Mm. Um, but so far, it looks very promising. We get yeah. We get very similar results, but obviously we get much faster results mm. and uh, in theory at least it's much more objective than me staring at the screen for each frame and saying where i think everything is mm. and and the computer doesn't get tired or hungry yeah like of course yeah. Yeah. yeah so the downside to a lot of the, the approaches that we use they use something called supervised learning so it's kind of like if you were teaching a student to do a new task you might show them show them the image that you want them to process mm. And then you might tell them what's the correct answer. This is the the structure that I want you to to highlight. Yeah. And you keep showing them more and more examples, and they'll pretty soon, hopefully, they'll pick that up. We do the same thing with a computer. So we give it loads of example images, and then we give it a label that sort of says this is the correct answer. This is the part of the image that we're mm -hmm. interested in. And um, the, then we train a neural network using that information and it tries to find the mapping between your labels and your images. So it tries mm. to spot patterns basically. So that takes time. So that's mm. the downside is that I might spend months actually developing a training set and, and training the models. But then in theory, once that works, I can release that and anybody can use it and nobody needs to do manual analysis anymore. Mm. So that's the goal. Okay, let's get back to that in a moment and hear a few words from our sponsors. This podcast is sponsored by Fibian. Fibian is an accurate sitting and physical activity tracking device and analysis platform. It is a great tool for projects that aim for behavior change in sedentary behavior and incidental physical activity. Fibian provides easy to understand PDF and web browser reports for participants. Other features include comparisons to recommendations, linking results to health risks, achievement cards, and interactive goal-setting tool. In addition, Fibian provides an API that allows for easy integration to other systems and applications. Learn more about Fibian at fibian.com research. Fibian. From researchers to researchers. So, so basically, am I right that with ultrasound images and muscle, muscle images, you don't have a big training data like you would have for many things that you can find from internet, like for example, translations, you can find thousands of yeah. books, millions of books that are in two languages and you can just use them. Yeah. And now you need to provide the data. Basically. Exactly right. Yeah. So if you happen to work for Google or Facebook or Amazon, then you have access to huge volumes of data. And, and in the case of something like Facebook, it's very often actually labeled data because people upload their own photos and then they highlight regions in the photo and, and say who is in this picture. Mm. What you're doing there is helping Facebook to train facial recognition yeah. algorithm. So that's good for them because it happens at scale. They have billions of users. Mm. But as you say, for ultrasound, we don't have open data sets because usually you're not allowed to share 
medical data freely. Yeah. And, um, and it's not the kind of task that really tempts people to, to want to do the labeling mm. because it's, it's slow yeah. and it's tedious. So that is the challenge. And there are ways around that with newer AI type methods. We can work with less data, but it is the biggest obstacle so yeah, far. Yeah. Yeah. And, and about Facebook, you said that we are kind of helping them. If, if I don't like Facebook, should I be labeling wrong persons and like a dog <laughs> to some person? So does it destroy fully the Facebook's algorithms? Uh, yeah. I don't know. Am I legally allowed to comment on that? But <laughs> I think it's an interesting suggestion. Yeah. Um, yeah, of course. Most people probably are okay with that deal, to be honest. Yeah. You know, Facebook have been, been in plenty of trouble before about how they use data and yeah. how they pass it on to other companies. Most people don't actually care at this yeah. point. Yeah. Uh, it's only once crimes have been committed that then they'll come back and say, actually, I'm not yeah. okay with such yeah. loose data recognition rules, uh, regulation rules. But. Yeah. And I, I think it's wonderful, like the Google photos, it will classify your pictures yeah. that which one has like, the lake, which one have person, which yep. one have bike, and so on. So after it works, you can actually find your pictures that you are you are looking for. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, you know those algorithms are actually not very efficient. You could train a child to do that job better and mm. more quickly. But the point is, when you have so much data available to you, mm. it's much easier than to train an algorithm and show it a million examples of lakes and whatever it is you want it to identify. Yeah, yeah. So if I go back to the training data, how much do you think you need to give for the ultrasound muscle images data that it will work well? And how much do you have now? How, how is your data set? Yeah, it's it's a really good question because it's something that in advance you have no idea. Mm. So I use something that uh, it's built on a concept called transfer learning. Basically, what you do is take an algorithm trained to do something else, maybe object classification like you talked about. Mm. And then you basically retrain part of it and say, remember everything that you've learned. Now I want to show you some images from a new task. Mm. And what that means is you can, you can make use of what it's already learned in a way, but then you can teach it some more specific examples for your, your particular task. Um, at the moment, for the two models that I've got, I've got something like five or 600 labeled images. Mm. which is actually not a lot when you think about, you know, if you train an algorithm to identify cats, mm. the, the sort of golden rule is roughly 10,000 images is the minimum you would need yeah. for it to actually really recognize cats accurately. So in that sense, it's a small data set. But on the other hand, if you've anybody who's worked with ultrasound data will know that labeling, I actually have two different models. So labeling in total 1,200 images is is a pretty laborious task um it seems to work let's say 90 95 percent of the time the way mm. that i would want it to and then the next question is well do you keep training more data to try mm. and make the model better or is it a case of diminishing returns that even if i add another five thousand images mm. maybe it doesn't really get much better just because the images are not brilliant yeah yeah so that's the hard point is knowing when is enough when is there enough data? Um, yeah. And that's why I think a lot of systems we have in the future, they'll be automated and built on deep learning type tools, but we'll still need the possibility for a human to occasionally go in and say, well, that one's clearly mislabeled. I'll correct that. Hmm. So I don't think we need to completely take the human out of the loop. Yeah. And, and do you think that the ultrasound imaging imaging technology will go much forward that the images will be better in the future or is it the limitation of the method itself yeah i mean my personal interest actually so mostly what i've been talking about so far is is two-dimensional ultrasound uh, because that's by far the most common application but we already have a 3d method mm. so you can take um in a sense more realistic scans of let's say a muscle tendon unit, because of course the human body doesn't work in two dimensions. It's, it's three dimensional. So we now have 4d ultrasound scans. And basically what that means is it's a 3d scan. The fourth dimension is time. So mm -hmm. you can take a video of the, let's say the muscle tendon unit in three mm -hmm. dimensions. And that's the sort of, that's the dream case. Mm -hmm. 
If we could do that in near real time, then we're in a position where we can actually look at quantifying the variables we're interested in way more accurately. Because hmm. this is the problem we have is that when you measure in two dimensions, we know that, as I said, muscles don't contract two dimensionally. Mm -hmm. So we know there's some kind of error in what we're seeing in the scan, but we don't know how big it is because we don't have that third dimension. Mm -hmm. We don't have the data. So that's what I would like to see happen. I'd like to see four dimensional ultrasound systems being developed because then I would go towards developing analysis tools for that scenario. Mm -hmm. Um, and then in theory, you can actually quantify what is the real muscle length, what is the real um, panation angle and, and things like this. And that's how we can take our knowledge, I think, to the next level. Yeah, yeah. And how, how far are the 4D imaging technology at the moment relating to cost, uh, technology, readiness and so on? Yeah, so I know of one, maybe two systems. Um, I've not got my hands on them yet. So they're certainly not widespread. So I think that we're, we're very early in that curve, mm. but there are a few papers published in the biomechanics field, basically showing three dimensional reconstructions of muscle fascicles. And that's very exciting. If we can, mm. if we can scale that up, um, because my long term vision would actually be to use something like, um, the tools I've been working with, but applied in three dimensions to yeah. these kind of images. Yeah. And how, how do you see, is it possible that the ultrasound will become wireless? Because I have seen like the studies, for example, that they do in, in Oslo, that they do from the start of the sprinting and they have this kind of system that it detaches yep. and flies to the air and yep. somebody catches it with something. So yeah, um, it could actually be that there is already a wireless system. Um, I've not seen it, but certainly we have this one mobile phone based system. So mm. literally just a, a probe plugged in via an adapter to the phone. And the image quality actually looks reasonably good from that All system. Right. So that's already a big step forward compared to, um, a lot of the systems that I've worked with. So my PhD, we used essentially a medical device, which weighs yeah. 200 and something kilos. You know, you can't. You can't do anything sort of natural in the field with a method like that. Mm. Um, yeah, I think wireless, in theory, it's certainly possible. Um, but it's, again, there's not a huge demand for it. And maybe that's why the development of technology is quite slow in this field. So basically, the biggest sort of demand for ultrasound systems is hospitals, because, mm. of course, they're looking at the developing fetus for mm -hmm. expecting parents. And so that kind of guides how the technology goes forward. And actually this, this 4D ultrasound, the main applications are exactly that scanning the, the baby in the uterus mm. and, and looking at the three dimensional form because it's kind of a, a luxury option that some parents want to see what their baby looks like already at that stage. Mm. So to my knowledge, it's only been applied once to scanning muscles. And that paper, I found the paper, but there's basically no figures or anything to, to sort of show you what, what are the data look like. So I'd say the jury is still out on that, but it's, it seems like it's, it's possible in the near future. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So basically you said that you were doing, uh, two things and we have been discussing about the image processing. And the other thing was that you are doing with the movement analysis. What kind of applications you see? The most promising applications for the markerless movement analysis. Yeah, so um, I was at a conference actually in in Calgary last summer, and already there were three or four companies there that were marketing this markerless tracking already. So mm -hmm. I think for coaches in particular, this is going to be a very useful tool because it's actually already feasible that you could have um, you could use the, the camera in your phone to record somebody, let's say running on a treadmill or even running around the track and apply this kind of algorithm to actually look at the joint angles during the movement. And that could be used for any, let's say track and field, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of disciplines where the joint angles at a certain point are of importance. Um, to use a more finished based example, look at the javelin. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing one project now where we're, we're looking at 
basically automating the analysis process of javelin throws so that you can give the coach and the athlete immediate feedback. Exactly the same concept. So we're using markerless tracking to identify different features, the thrower and the javelin. And then we're going to hopefully turn that into software that basically within a minute or so of the throw gives the feedback they want. So the, the angle of the javelin, the release velocity, but also mm. maybe the joint angles of the of the uh, limb at release point and these kind of things. Yeah. So I think applications like that, probably in the next five or 10 years already, we're going to see loads of mobile phone apps like this, where you can take it into the field and, and quantify some kind of movement somehow. Yeah. And for the javelin, do you think it would be the feedback in the in the Olympics that you do the first throw and then you get the feedback that you, you put it a little bit too high or a little bit too low or... Yeah, so this is a, a really important ethical question because uh, certainly in training we can use systems like this. There's yeah. nothing. There's nothing to stop the Finnish athletes using that, for example. Yeah. In competition, I suspect that we wouldn't be allowed to do that right now. Um, having said that, the last few, um, last World Championships, and the last Olympic Games, and certainly the next Olympic Games, there's been a big investment in exactly this kind of technology. So mm. markerless tracking is one, but trying to give the the uh, the viewer at home more feedback. So I think it's already actually possible that we could do exactly what you said, mm. that you the, the, the athlete would have an earpiece in, mm. the coach would be looking at, at the data, and within you know a minute of that first throw, the coach has got a report there and he's feeding information back to the athlete. Mm. Then, of course, we come down to the the ethical side of that um should we allow that and and so on i'm not going to get into yeah, that but i think yeah. it's fascinating about the potential um but of course one major issue there is you have to have the cameras to use that particular example you've got to have cameras positioned around the stadium yeah and um that's not necessarily an easy thing to do you can't just go along and hang your own cameras from the ceiling of the stadium usually. yeah yeah so, and uh, how about if this was like the sport, some of the sport applications, uh, do you see that you can diagnose some diseases before you can diagnose them from the other ways, from the way people move? Well, yeah, there's a lot of development in this field, actually. So one app that I'm aware of is to, um, to try and detect symptoms of Parkinson's disease mm -hmm. before you know, a doctor has actually diagnosed it. And that was based on analysis of handwriting. So you, mm. you do some writing tasks on a tablet yeah. and it analyzes the motion patterns there. And yeah, potentially with gait disorders, that's something that we could maybe do in the future. But the, the question, and at the moment, this is a big question mark is, is how sensitive and how accurate do those systems need to be to be able to detect what are probably really subtle changes to your gait. Mm. So if you've got, let's say, early onset Parkinson's, how does that appear in your gait? And can we detect it, for example, using a mobile phone pointed at the person while they walk mm. and then running an AI algorithm to analyze it? Yeah. I don't know. It may be that at least at the moment we, we don't have enough sensitivity to do yeah. that. But then again... Again, if we go forward five years from now, who knows? Yeah, but am I right that this is again about the amount of data that is being recorded in a similar situation? So I'm thinking that if you have a, a webcam on your TV or something and every day you pass by it, you are walking towards the fritz or <laughs> whatever. So basically on the same time of the day, you are doing the same task, walking to the fritz. And, and you could say that it's probably quite similar walking from day to day. Yeah. And wouldn't it be, be quite easy from like thousands of repetitions to see that now your step starts to get shorter you start to have side differences or something yeah potentially it's, so it's partly about about the volume of data but there are especially with markerless tracking there are other issues that that sort of make it difficult so one is the clothing that somebody wears because mm -hmm. we're trying to detect yeah. things like in theory that the hip joint center let's say 
Yeah. It's very hard to, to say anything about that if they're wearing jeans or, or whatever. Um, so I think there's always going to be a degree of, of inaccuracy because of things like that. I don't know if you live in a really warm climate, um, where for example, the, the lower limb is always visible mm. and maybe you have enough cameras placed around the home, which could be something that, that people are doing. Mm. Uh, in the near future maybe yeah maybe you can build a customized model just for that person that recognizes yeah. that person very well yeah. um, again it will just it just depends partly also on how how much change needs to happen before we can actually detect it and say that's definitely a sign of some kind of clinical condition mm. but let's say that cameras are not expensive and are getting cheaper all the time. And if I would know that if you place these five cameras to your home, we can detect Parkinson's or yep. some uh, disease really early on. And we actually have a treatment for in this stage, so you can prevent it. Yep. Maybe I could buy the cameras. Yeah, and, of course. And the system. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And th there's already a lot of work done in, in similar applications. So for example, falls detection. Hmm. So if you've got an older person living at home, um, then of course there's an advantage if you can detect when that person's had a fall. Yeah. They might not be able to pick up the phone. So yeah. a lot of work's being done on things like that. Yeah. Um, but that's a slightly, uh, I don't want to say simple task, but it's slightly simpler perhaps than detecting an actual gait abnormality. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's for me, the false detection is like, uh, we are, we are working with accelerometers yep. and, and so on. And even if we tell that we are doing sitting and activity analysis and people are, are you detecting the falls? <laughs> I'm like, no, that's not really our thing. Yeah, but you could do that. Uh, we could do that, but there's like thousand companies doing it. Yeah. And I don't know how, how good is the fall detection to my uneducated mind? It seems like really simple task, like, you see some acceleration and then the acceleration really slows down. There's maybe crawling or something or no movement. It, it's quite easy. Or yeah. Is it? I mean, in the case of a wearable device, which we haven't touched on yet, but of course that's the other option rather than cameras, you can have a wearable device. Mm. Um, certainly there will be fall situations where yes, there's a really clear signature pattern of acceleration, but maybe not all falls are quite so clear cut. Mm. Uh, so which is one problem. The other problem is that for a wearable to detect falls really well, they have to wear it all the time. Mm. And so, you know, a lot of wearable devices, okay, if it's a wristwatch, maybe they'll keep it on mm. all, all day. Uh, the Aura Ring, actually, the Finnish company, is, I think, a very nice concept. So that's, you wear it on your finger, mm. you don't need to take it off. So a device like that maybe has better scope for being an accurate false detector yeah but if it's you know a lot of false detection devices traditionally were things that maybe you had to strap on a belt or something the more cumbersome it is the less likely the person is to wear it which yeah. means you know yeah. it's not going to it's not going to prevent any falls if it's not being yeah. worn and and the advantage with the ring is that you actually know when the person is wearing it's measuring the galvanic skin response or? yeah so there's there's various things there during the day it's mostly looking at acceleration um yeah. and i think it also measures yeah body temperature um and then during the night time it's obviously focused more as a sleep tracker but mm. i think as a solution that's maybe the direction that i would go just because mm. personally i'm less likely to need to take the ring off ever Mm. so that you know if people go in the shower and they take off the device when they come back out if they forget to put it back on yeah again it's it's yeah. not useful okay let's get back to that in a moment and hear a few words from our sponsors this podcast is sponsored by fibian a research device that has been shown to be valid in tracking sitting standing physical activity and energy expenditure furthermore Fibian has been shown to be valid categorizing physical activity into light, moderate, and vigorous intensity. In addition to scientific accuracy, Fibian provides automatically produced and easy-to-understand reports for research participants. Get scientific validation and learn more about Fibian at fibian.com research. Yeah, and, and you said in the beginning something about 
patients and rehab exercises. Could you tell a little bit more about this? Yeah, so actually one, one thing that's commonly done in a clinical setting is gait analysis. Uh, in Finland, we have clinical gait labs devoted just to this. So horse has one, for example, but all over the world, this is a common thing. If somebody has, let's say, a brain injury that affects the way they walk, then in the rehab process, we might want to try and restore something more like normal gait. So we would use motion analysis mm. for something like that. And this can be done in the lab. So we have a setup in Uvascular Lab. Loads of labs around the world have it, but it's very expensive. At a dedicated lab just for that, or mainly for that task. If we could rely instead on, for example, a set of mobile phones and use the cameras from the phones and collect the data, process that using AI algorithms, if we could get that to be sensitive enough, then we have a really cheap solution to, to monitoring somebody's gait as they go mm. through the rehab process. So potentially there are cost savings there, but also it's more flexible that if you could, put, for example, do rehab in the patient's own home mm. rather than them having to come to the hospital as an outpatient, you know, that's it's more convenient for the patients. And then, of course, we can look at how do we actually use that data. If we build up big data sets like this, those can then be used in future to train algorithms um, for classifying future patients, perhaps. Mm. Yeah, and and you mentioned wearables. How do you see the the future of AI and wearables? Yeah, it's um, it's very difficult to track because again, the, the conference I was at last summer, it felt like every every second or third presentation was about wearables, mm. and AI is being used in some way because, of course, they're collecting lots of data. Yeah, yeah, I think it's already sort of revolutionizing the way that we we think about health and human movement and right now we've got all these devices that are collecting data basically 24 7 so that means we're building good models that are getting better at classifying this person is sitting this person standing they're walking and so on mm. so i think we're already going towards a point where they're so sort of embedded in our lives that 10 or 15 years from now we'll all have some kind of wearable. We'll all be mm. tracking, um, for example, physical activity in more sophisticated ways than just you know, a pedometer on the waistband, which was what it was 10 or 15 years ago, mm. counting your steps. We'll be able to go into much higher resolution detail. Yeah. Um, and so, for example, one project that we're working on is we developed a wearable device where we can actually segment individual steps. So from that we get not only something like the step count but then we can also look at um, potentially is the the step duration different between the left leg and the right leg for example does somebody have mm. some sort of clinical disorder that affects one side of the body more than the other um, these are the kind of things that it's much sort of higher resolution information that we could use in sport we could use it in rehab mm. in the future and w where do you have the wearable for this segmenting of steps? It's actually at the top, between the shoulder blades okay. at the moment. So we're combining that with AI algorithms to basically identify key signatures from, let's say, the accelerometry signal. Yeah. Uh, in our case, we do this outdoors. So we've got something called sensor fusion. We've got GPS built in as well. So that's quite a high-end, expensive solution. So it's very mm. much a research tool. But potentially in the future, of course, usually when you scale up technology, it gets cheaper. So it may be that we can use something like this in a more standard, low-cost wearable device. Yeah. Um, it may be that for some metrics like limb imbalances, maybe we need to add additional sensors on the shoes, mm. for example. But I think at least our generation and, and younger are sort of raised on this idea that it's completely normal to wear this stuff. Mm. It's not seen so much as an encumbrance that you have to constantly be reminded to wear these things. It's it sort of part of our mm. our culture. So eventually, who knows? Maybe we build the sensors into the footwear, even so people are buying buying their clothing that's already it's got embedded sensors. 
Mm. And is it that if you have the sensor centrally placed, then you can, with one sensor, you can see the differences between left and right? Potentially with the right algorithm. Um, I think you would need a lot of training data for something yeah. like that. It would be probably infinitely simpler to just have devices placed on the ankles, on the shoes, or, or whatever. Yeah. So if you had a, a three sensor system, yeah, it would make the development, the, the analysis side so much simpler. Yeah. But basically with, if you have it on your left hand, for example, wrist yeah. wearable, you cannot detect. Yeah, of course. But then if you have yeah. it on the left and, and potentially and centrally, yeah, you can, you can train an algorithm to detect characteristics of one limb versus the other, maybe. Uh, but again, I don't know what sort of data set or what sort of training data set you would need yeah. for that. But, yeah. you know, nowadays a company like Nike could do something like this because they have enough users. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I saw a news, uh, maybe, maybe two weeks ago or something that there was that your wearable can, can predict whether you have a flu coming. And it just made me think that it's not very difficult for me to notice by myself that mm -hmm. I have a flu coming, that my nose is running, I'm feeling tired and so on. So how often do you think it will actually really give better indication than the subjective feeling? Yeah. I mean, maybe it depends on the actual parameter you're measuring. So in that, in that example, yeah, like you said, I don't need anyone to tell me I'm getting sick. If I find out 12 hours earlier, then mm -hmm. I would have detected anyway. I'm not sure if that's going to change my life dramatically. Yeah. Um, yeah, at this point, I probably wouldn't put too much faith in in a claim like that. I think my interest as a scientist is more in, in you having the device and telling your friends who also get one, and so we can build the data sets, yeah. which we can then use to more accurately in the future yeah. properly characterize things because yeah. one of the biggest problems with wearables is the data are unstructured yeah which means that you might have the device on for 24 7 but you're not writing in a diary exactly what you were doing yeah yeah so it's very hard to sort of for example say well how does running more often um affect let's say your sleep patterns well unless we can clearly identify when specifically you're running Mm. and how well you slept you know it's a very hard mm. problem to solve yeah. so we need better predictive models first yeah. i would say yeah and that's challenging because of course you've got loads of companies selling different devices yeah and they use different algorithms and those algorithms are usually protected so we yeah. don't actually know when you see a result on your on your watch yeah on your phone app we don't actually know how they got that, mm. which as scientists, that's hard to accept because we want to know how did you go from raw signal to what I can see here. Yeah, yeah. So for AI to develop faster, you would need the open data sets. And now most of it's not open. So companies are developing their own algorithms. Yeah, I mean, that's part of it. What, what you, in a way, what you need is a company like, let's say, Google to develop their own sensor and everybody to buy it. So mm. everybody's data is going to the same platform. Mm. There are dangers associated with that, but in terms of developing a good model, if everybody had the same device that measures things in the same way, it would make it easier for us to build models then that actually make good predictions. Mm. But at the moment, if you've got a polar device and somebody else has got a Sonda device, maybe they're processing their data in different ways, so mm. you can't then compare between yourselves and um so yeah unfortunately we'll probably never get to that point because of course you'd, you'd need a monopoly you'd need one company to just wipe out all of the others which arguably google could do that and just buy all of the other companies anyway but they they bought the fitbit so now they have the have the data for, yeah yeah for those. yeah i don't know how good thing it is <laughs> Yeah, so I was saying about the when the AI could be better than the subjective feeling. I'm also doing quite a bit of sports and like some device telling me that now you have trained hard and you are tired. Mm -hmm. It's it's not really surprising. You really <laughs> feel it. So I'm thinking like, is it is it more like signals about our brain and maybe our heart? Because those things we don't know this 
that easily by ourselves. So what what do you think? Yeah, I think the heart is a really interesting example. Um, so there've been a couple of papers in the last year or so where basically people have used ECG data from from a hospital, let's say, mm. and been able to detect certain conditions uh, that perhaps a doctor couldn't easily detect, partly mm. because they had such a big training set, it, it makes it easier to sort of detect these subtle little differences. And I'm not a heart expert by any stretch of the imagination, but I know that, that heart rate um, and heart rate variability are very commonly used metrics in a lot of, you know, really broad spectrum of physiology applications. Mm. I think that that would be a really interesting area to basically figure out, is there extra, is there added information that we're not yet aware of in that signal that could could answer that question for you and basically tell you something that you don't yet feel. Mm. But it's a, it's there's something in the internal dynamics of your heart uh, that can be detected with an algorithm. I mm. think that's that's hugely exciting if we can yeah. if we can go down that path because we already have the devices to collect the data. Yeah. You know, there are plenty of options there. Yeah, I agree. And and if I go to a little bit different theme like you are a biomechanist by trade and now you have moved, moved more to development of AI, so I think you are a good person to explain how how difficult it is to make uh AI system, how difficult it is to write the algorithms or, or the system. Could you tell more about that? Yeah, that's uh that's always a relative question. It depends, of course, where you what background you're coming from. This was partly the reason I wanted to, to do an actual master's degree rather than just um how I started actually was kind of doing online courses and in my spare time reading things, but I I couldn't actually develop anything mm. like that. Um I'd say the hardest part is getting your head around the concepts and actually trying to understand how do these methods work. Um, so I spent, before I started the master's degree, I probably spent over a year just reading about AI in general, about neural networks, about the mm. mathematics behind them. What do they actually do? How do they work? And um, yeah, I, w I definitely wouldn't say it's easy to build these applications, but th the good thing from the point of view of writing code is that Usually, once I've got to the point where everything runs, I can reuse that. So I'll I'll train a model, and it might mm. be that that model is not very good. The results are not very good, but then I can go back, add more data, and I can just rerun the mm. thing. So there's definitely uh, a steep curve at the beginning where you're sort of getting to the point where your method actually does what you want it to do. Yeah, that's getting easier, I would say, though nowadays because it, there's a big open source movement. So mm. if you go to look at something, some kind of deep learning application, let's say, usually you'll find somebody's released some kind of code in Python, let's say, that you can go and get that and then you can build on top of it. Hmm. So actually a lot of what I've done has been look around, find what somebody else has done that almost solves my problem, hmm. um, take that and then build my own things on top of that, apply it to my problem. So. If we compare now to even 10 years ago, I'd say it's much easier to do it now. Yeah. But of course, it, it's partly about matching the, the tool to the job as well, which is not always easy because there are a lot of tools. Yeah. So if there's somebody listening now this and thinking that maybe I can do the same thing moving to doing my own AI things, uh, what would you say? How long does it take? How many years of, of studying that you can do rudimentary things with AI? Yeah, that's a hard question. Um, if you come from a, a more traditional sort of sport and health background, mm. it's going to take longer just because if you take a sports science degree, for example, usually there's no real programming component there. Mm. So you don't sort of learn from an early stage about the potential of computers and how to communicate with them. Because that's mm. really what we're doing here is we're trying to train a computer to do a job for us. Mm. That's basically why we use AI. Um, so if you come from an IT background, I would say go for it. You know, it's within a year or two, you can probably be building applications that do what you want them to do. Mm -hmm. If not, then I think you've got to start at the beginning and actually learn the basics of, of programming to figure out how to actually get the computer to do what you want. Because if you can't mm -hmm. do that, you know, even if you find open source code that's promising, 
if you don't have the ability to work with it and to build on it, then you're not going to get a working solution. Yeah. So, so probably better to find somebody to collaborate with. Yeah. Yeah. If it's an interesting idea, you can call me. And, uh, no, I mean, yeah. to be serious, it's, um, that's one obviously efficient way to do it is if you have the idea, but not the resources, not everybody wants to go back to studying like I did. Yeah. Uh, I understand that. And I'm, I'm not going to say everyone should go and sign up for a master's degree. It's, it's got to fit the person, but there's plenty of expertise around in the world now, not just in Finland, but, but, uh, internationally as well. So mm. finding a collaborator probably won't be too challenging mm. in this field. So, so you said that it could be also you, uh, you could maybe tell here that what kind of projects you would be interested in. And if somebody has a good data set of something, what should it be the data about that you would be really excited to work with them? Yeah. Well, how long do we have? I mean, there's, yeah, there's a load of possibilities here. So gate, human gate is one thing that's always fascinated yeah. me. So that's uh, one area where I'll be working pretty heavily. Image processing is another, not just ultrasound, but any form of, of um, medical imaging in particular, any kind of detection within an image, whether it's a person, um, a, a particular tissue or structure or whatever. And then Another thing I've been working with, which I didn't mention yet, is actually producing data, so synthetic data, mm-hmm. using something called generative modeling. So basically, you you give it a sample of, um, let's say, ultrasound images, real ones, and you train a generative model to actually make essentially fake ones that look like the real ones. Um, and my interest there is mainly in the medical domain, helping to be able to share data. So mm. if, if you've generated synthetic data that looks like real data, but it doesn't belong to anybody, then there are no ethical implications there of sharing that data with somebody else. There's no chance that a person could be identified from the data because it literally doesn't belong to anybody. So that's one interesting avenue. But can um, I just pause you there? Yep. Uh, I didn't understand what's the point if it doesn't belong, if it's not real data, what's the point of well, sharing it? We can use... Uh, images like that to train models, for example, so train predictive models. So let's say you've got a rare medical condition mm. where you have a very small data set. To scale that up, you could basically analyze the statistical properties of, of what you have and then produce images that are similar All right. to increase the size of your data set. And this is actually used quite a lot in the medical domain, yeah. partly because it's sometimes just really hard to get big data sets hmm. because it's medical data it's it's sensitive yeah uh, so my actually my main interest there apart from this sharing possibility is is training better mm. predictive models so getting more data that way yeah um, but it's also built on something called unsupervised learning yeah. which I think is very promising because we talked a lot about the uh, it being very laborious to label data for this Uh, supervised learning approach with unsupervised learning you basically leave the algorithm to find the patterns for you so you don't actually have to give it labeled examples mm. and this is quite a new topic in a way we're really at the uh, in the infancy of using unsupervised learning but this is something that in the future if we can build better unsupervised models then the the applications of that are absolutely huge because it means we don't have to keep finding these labeled data sets We don't have to keep paying people to track points in an ultrasound image or whatever the image is of. So that's sort of one of my bigger focus areas. Yeah. Um, so if I pause you again there, how do you, if it's unlabeled data, how does it work that you can still use it to teach the system? Yeah. So one, it's, it's a bit of a long explanation, which I'll I'll spare you. But basically what one of the methods I've used does is... um We give it a set of real images and yeah. we give it a set of, um, let's call them fake images that encode the properties of the real images. Yeah. So they kind of look like real images yeah. um, very broadly. And what this method does is learn to segment the real images based yeah. on these fake ones. So yeah. with with the fake ones, what you're really kind of saying to the algorithm is um, these are the sort of key features. Mm. 
which sounds a bit like the labeling process, but actually you can generate these automatically. So you don't actually have to manually track anything. And, um, and that takes a few seconds, basically. Mm. So we feed those, the real images and the fake ones in. And then we say, use the fake one to try and help you analyze the real one. Mm. Basically, I know it's a, a complicated <laughs> yeah. explanation. Uh. Um, and it, it doesn't work brilliantly from, from what I've tried yet, but I've done it on a really small scale. Mm. And I think that's something that's hugely promising that eventually you could, you could show an algorithm like this, a real image, and it could segment it for you mm. without you having to do actually anything, no labeling at any point. And so obviously for the medical field, if you can make something like that work, you have your analysis pipeline ready so that you take the scan. And by the time the patient comes out of the scanner, you've already got uh, an analyzed, a segmented image. Mm. So I think that that potentially is going to be very important yeah. um, in the future. But sort of to come back to your original question, which I've now strayed really far I, from. I forgot it already. Uh, yeah. Which was basically what am I interested in if somebody yeah, wants yeah. to collaborate? Um, pretty much anything in the field of sport and health. So I'm interested yeah. in build, building sport applications like the javelin example I mentioned. But I'm also interested in working with clinical scientists, hospitals, uh, to try and make tools for them that mm. don't require loads of money to set up, that, that are simple, maybe they're mobile phone based, Mm. so that we can increase the standard of care without having to increase the budget associated with it. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it has been really interesting discussions. Is there something specific you would still like to like to bring up? Uh, I don't think so. I, I guess if I were going to say something to people in this area in general, especially the younger generation, yeah, I would say if you're if you're thinking about going down this pathway, then definitely do because I think there's big job potential for people in sport and health in the future mm. based around analytics and working with so-called big data and applying AI te type technologies to new problems. So um, I think the infrastructure, so in terms of educating sports scientists, for example, is not yet there to train mm. them to be eventually data scientists, at least if we look at the, the programs that I've come from and that I work in. But I think that's going to be coming in the very near future. I think mm. already um, institutions are reacting to that and they're starting to come up with new programs that teach these kind of skills, um, understanding AI, understanding how to work with large volumes of data. Yeah, Definitely get involved in that kind of thing because I think there are job titles that don't even exist yet that are coming. Yeah, And it would be great to be to be part of that yeah and i think if you want to have a good salary you go for google <laughs> as they now have their wearables yeah thing, so yeah yeah now it, it has been it has been very interesting and then and then this is the this is the funny question like that people always like say that the ai will take over the world like how is your algorithm with, <laughs> which is analyzed the ultrasound images how long does it take that it will slave the humankind oh they, i don't uh, actually, I won't say it like that because this is being recorded. I'll say <laughs> the prediction of when will this come, so they call it general artificial intelligence, when will it come is always about 50 years. Yeah. I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime. Yeah. Um, certainly not any of my algorithms going on to take over the world. But the thing about AI is it's always, or almost always trained to do a really narrow task. Mm -hmm. So in my case, I'm training something to just look at ultrasound images detect features if you show the same old uh, same algorithm a different image let's say a ct scan or an x-ray mm. it will fail completely mm. because it hasn't been trained on that kind of image yeah so that's important to remember that whenever you read these papers about really exciting new ai applications it's usually a really narrow task yeah and that's okay because yeah. if it if it does the task well then it's still really useful yeah but to get something that's going to take over the world and, you know, destroy us all, what you'd have to do is put all of those capabilities together into one computer, one algorithm. And yeah. realistically, I'm not convinced that that's ever going to happen. Yeah. And isn't it just the good thing about AI that it's really narrow task because then it's usually a boring task that we want to actually give it to the computer? Yeah, well, that's usually sort of the motivation is that 
each person who's published one of these papers or, or at Google published a new model that does something, they had a specific task in mind. And so they developed one, one solution just for that. The fact that it won't deal with new tasks usually mm. is not a problem. If we mm. needed to do something else, then we just have to train a separate model to do yeah. that, that yeah. other task. So I think for most of us, it, it's not a problem at all. Yeah. But of course, there's that's a big movement as well. There are people who are trying to build more generalizable algorithms. Yeah. Um, personally, I'm not. I'm not worried. I'm not going to yeah. lose any sleep over anything yeah. like that at this point. Yeah. All right. That's a good thing to finish. <laughs> Thanks a lot. It it was thrilling discussions, and I, I learned a lot. So thank you. Thanks for a coming. lot. Thank you. This podcast is sponsored by Fibian. Get scientific validation and learn more about Fibian at fibian.com slash research. The Physical Activity Researcher podcast has created an activity tracker purchase guide for researchers. Get your free copy from the link in the podcast description. Thank you for listening to the Physical Activity Researcher podcast.